with chapter party agreements and to explain this i will use the same example that i had used um, in my previous module on inco terms so going back to that example where i had shown that you know uh, i'm the buyer in uh, brussels and i'm looking to uh, buy some goods from a supplier from a seller in nottingham nottingham not being a port city the goods will have to be uh, transported via road to southampton and then from southampton they come to the nearest port city antwerp and finally to my warehouse in brussels now uh, depending on what inco terms i have selected with my seller either the seller would be responsible for shipping the goods from uh, southampton to antwerp or uh, from nottingham to southampton or if um, i am i take the responsibility i select the inco terms uh, for example x works in which uh, the seller is not responsible for shipping the goods but is only responsible for making available the goods at his warehouse then in that case i as the buyer have to um, you know uh, take up the responsibility of uh, shipping the goods so depending on the inco terms of who is the of what inco terms are selected either the seller would be the shipper or the buyer would be the shipper so we have to understand that the shipper can be anyone can be the seller or the buyer depending on your inco terms with the other party so yes moving forward now i am the buyer in brussels i'm importing goods from nottingham and uh, let's say in my example i chose to um, uh, i chose that the seller should be the shipper okay so i do not want to take the headache of uh, the shipping so the seller is going to be the shipper all right so now this shipper this uh, seller who is also the shipper will have to find a ship owner to transport the goods from southampton to antwerp and uh, the ship owner will carry the goods from southampton to antwerp in return for a certain sum of money which is known as freight uh, the ship owner and the shipper both are governed by the contract of carriage okay so the ship owner will issue a bill of lading to the shipper and we have an entire module on uh, bill of lading so we will see what is a bill of lading also in the next module for now we have to understand charter party so now moving ahead now this shipper that is the seller will have to hire a middleman who is also known as a charterer so this seller is looking for he actually wants a ship owner to you know ship his goods but he can also look for a middleman known as a charterer and this charterer will enter into a charter party agreement with this ship owner okay to carry the cargo now it may also be the case that you do not have the charterer okay say you do not have the charterer and then in that case the seller wants to have the direct relationship with the uh, ship owner all right so there can be two scenarios now moving ahead and all right so i am back with the slide again yes so these are our parties and we have seen that there can be multiple shippers who enter into a contract with this charterer and these are known as contracts of agreement basically governed by carriage of goods act as well as certain international conventions on the other hand we have the charterer entering into a contract with the ship owner so you see when you have to transport goods from one place to another two scenarios might occur okay firstly it can be uh, that um, firstly it might be the first scenario is that when the ship owner lends his entire vessel the ship owner lends his entire vessel to um, uh, or a part of his vessel in return for a fees okay to carry the goods on his ship this is known as a charter party agreement okay and it can be a time charter bare boat charter or a void charter we will look into that and the second scenario is when this ship owner employs his vessel in liner trade ship okay so in liner trade shipping what happens is that he offers a a space in his vessel to anyone who wants to transport goods okay so this is known uh, and in that case he will issue a bill of lading so bill of lading can be issued by the charterer also if we have a charterer who has chartered this ship or we can have the bill of lading directly from the ship owner okay so he will issue the bill of lading directly to the shipper we do not have the charterer in that case okay and small traders usually go for uh, these types of contracts of agreement because 
um, it is practically not possible for a shipper with a small quantity of cargo to end, to charter an entire ship okay so these are two distinct contracts but sometimes these contracts also overlap they are not mutually exclusive so we will look into this uh, in the coming module all right now we have to also look at certain you know important terms because we should not get confused and many times what happens in international trade is that one party is playing the role of actually two parties like for example this uh, the seller can be the shipper or the buyer can be the shipper okay so one person is the seller as well as a shipper or the buyer as well as the shipper okay so we have to know this the seller it's this is very easy the seller is the person who is selling the goods buyer is the person who's buying the goods now like i said the shipper can be the buyer or the seller whoever is taking the responsibility of shipping the goods all right now if your inco terms is something like x works then definitely your buyer is the shipper because the buyer is taking the responsibility buyer is just going to take the goods from the seller in his warehouse and then the seller goes out of picture now it's the buyer who's the shipper in any other case like maybe like cif or uh, um, D dat or dpu then in that case the seller will be the shipper all right freight forwarder now these are also there are certain specific companies who are um, you know they are uh, specializing in arranging trans, uh, arranging the export import formalities and the custom clearance basically some of these companies also reserve spaces with shipping company lines okay so these are freight forwarders so sometimes you have these third party intermediaries also consigner is the person who sending the goods consignee is the person who is receiving the goods now it might sound very obvious that this consignee is obviously the buyer who is getting the goods but many times what happens is that in the bill of lading also they do not mention the name of the buyer as the consignee you know why because the buyer might change so what happens in international trade is that when the goods are transporting via sea many times the goods are sold when the goods uh, the goods are sold while they are at the high seas so the goods are actually shifting uh, the goods the ownership of the goods is shifting from one buyer to another so the goods are say um, on the high seas for a month and when they first set sail they were with buyer one and then while they are on the high seas just by transferring the bill of lading the the goods get sold to another party to buyer two to buyer three and finally it goes to buyer number five so by the time they reach the final destination the goods have been sold at least four to five times and in case of uh, crude oil and petroleum the goods the, the products are actually sold more than a hundred times and that's how the prices inflate all right so the consignee may be mentioned in the bill of lading or might just be mentioned as you know to the order of the buyer or whoever is the buyer at that time okay all right so the consignee may not always be mentioned like the, the name of the party might not be mentioned in the bill of lading all the time it can just be mentioned as to the order of dash okay whatever but the party's name might not be mentioned so whoever is the consignee at that moment of time will be entitled to take the delivery of goods all right now we also have to understand who is the carrier because i'll be referring to the carrier many times uh, in this lecture we know who is the shipper we know who is the buyer and seller the consigner and consignee now let's see who is the carrier carrier is the shipping line that is transporting the goods all right the company or the party which has undertaken who is actually transporting the goods is known as the carrier now in demise charter the charter the charterer is the carrier in a time of voyage charter the ship owner is the carrier now if if you do not understand the statement at this stage don't worry we will be studying each of these types of charter parties and in that case after studying those uh, charter parties this will be very clear okay now a carrier will issue the shipper with a bill of lading a receipt for which is a receipt for the cargo ship which also serve as a evidence for the contract of carriage so i was telling about bills of lading so uh, whoever is the shipper will receive the bill of lading and they will receive this from the carrier now we had seen in the previous lectures that there are uh, in, in the previous slides that there are two scenarios either the charterer might issue a bill of lead uh, a bill of leading or the ship owner himself might issue a bill of leading okay but whoever but this will be the carrier who is issuing now either the the charterer might be the carrier or the ship owner himself who is a trading line company they might issue the bill of leading all right now but but what is the difference between the two we i had 
shown you that there are two distinct entities uh, i mean there are sorry there are two distinct agreements the bill of lading and the charter party and uh, if you remember i had shown you that uh, the bill of lading was marked in green and the charter party was marked in red so now let's see what is the actual difference between these two the bill of lading co uh, contract is a contract between the carrier and the shipper of goods the charter party is a contract between the charterer and the owner of the ship uh, the bill of lading is a contract for goods whereas the charter party is a contract for the ship now this is the main underlying difference if you remember this then it will be very easy for you to remember bill of lading is basically receipt for the goods and charter party is not for goods it's for the ship okay so you are actually hiring the ship entire ship or a part of the ship now there is a, when i had explained a, a little bit about the bill of lading i had also told that there are certain uh, international conventions that govern this apart from you know the carriage of goods um, uh, uh, carriage of goods by sea act the cogsa act in the uk so in addition to that there are also international conventions the three international conventions the most popular one is the hague visby rules so these mandatorily apply if uh, if a bill of lading is issued in the contracting state means in a country which is a party to this convention then these rules by default apply and these are very popular and uh, beneficial rules i would say for the carrier okay so so these rules i mean if you are a carrier uh, these rules might really benefit you all right so they these rules apply mandatorily but they do not apply mandatorily in case of a charter party agreement but still come many times uh, parties want these uh, want the application of these hague visby rules so in that case they apply uh, these hague visby rules by mentioning specifically in the contract that hague visby rules must apply so these are the difference between a bill of lading and a charter party very much in brief because the, there are a lot of differences and we can really go much into detail but if you are interested do let me know and i can forward you some more content on bill of lading and charter party agreements so now we have understood the difference between bill of lading and charter party now let's start with actual what are charter party agreements so charter party this word was you know, this practice is not new if, if this practice was developed in the middle ages uh to execute a document in two parts and then the document was actually torn and each party had one part okay so that's how this term of charter party came and that's why now uh, we have two multi two three multiple copies of a charter party and this is uh, the word charter party is derived from the latin term carta partita okay i hope i've pronounced it right okay so this is the charter party is a written agreement between the ship owner and the charterer for a contract of carriage and we will look into the different charter party agreements in detail in this module uh, the charter party is a highly important document because it allocates the rights obligations duties and liabilities between all the parties okay um, now this uh, the charter party is a written agreement between the ship owner or the disponent owner and the charterer for the contract of carriage now i have used this term disponent owner over here okay i have used this term disponent owner okay uh, the reason is because uh, many times in charter party some person or some company basically some company takes up the place of the registered owner for all commercial operations okay many times like i said you have third party intermediaries also you have freight forwarders you, you, there are a lot of intermediaries in uh, international trade because a lot of things are outsourced so similarly if if the owner of the vessel has employed a, a specialized party for all the commercial operations and has outsourced his duty so then they are not the owners but they are doing the work of the owner so that's why they come the disponent owner that's why i've mentioned disponent owner okay so disponent owner is a party who has full control over the ship just like the owner but they are obviously not the registered owners okay now also the charterer can there can be sub charterers also okay in, the, in when there are sub charterers you can have like a, a head charter and then different head uh, sub charterers under them all right now the entire uh, ship can be chartered or a part of it can be chartered so this will be known as a part charter or a slot charter so we can define a charter party agreement as an agreement between the ship owner and the charterer whereby the ship owner lets out a part of the ship or the entire ship okay 
Okay, now moving ahead, there are three types of charters. The first is the bare board charter, which is also known as a demise charter. Okay, and okay, yeah, so this is all they are also known as a demise charter, the bare board charter or the demise charter. Then, secondly, you have okay, so the bare board charter is a contract for the lease of ship and. Firstly, I'm going to explain a bare board charter and if you have um, if you have paid attention in my module on nationality of ships, I have explained bare board charter over there also, but we will be repeating it over here as well. So bare board charter um, is uh, is very much explained in uh, nationality of ships as well. So you can check it over there and then you have the voyage charter, which is a contract for specifically for the a specific voyage okay so the voyage might be decided like for example it might be mentioned that the voyage is from um, in our example it was from uh, Southampton to Antwerp okay um, so the, the voyage that is the journey might be mentioned so that is a voyage charter a time charter means for a fixed period of time like for six months or eight months and sometimes you can also have hybrids like for example a voyage and a time charter together so this would be like a round trip of the UK in eight weeks. So this is a time as well as a um, a time as well as a voyage charter. All right. So now let's move ahead to bare boat charter. This is actually already explained, but just in case if you have missed, let's see. A bare boat charter is also known as a demise charter. This is a very for popular form of charter and uh, this is a practice in whereby the ship of one country is allowed to temporarily fly the uh, flag of another country. So let's say a ship is uh, uh, say a ship is registered in the Bahamas, but then it is chartered to a US national, then the US national can temporarily fly the flag of uh, the Bahamas. So in the extra uh, in the uh, example that I had explained, let's understand bare boat charter this way. Uh, Mr. A owns a ship in Bulgaria. So here we have Mr. A who is the owner of the ship who owns a ship in Bulgaria and flies a Bulgarian flag. Mr. A wants to lease out the ship to make some money. So he leases out this ship to Mr. B, okay, who is from Croatia. Okay, and then they both enter into a charter party agreement. And once the bare boat charter is, uh, is executed, the ship will now fly the Croatian flag instead of the Bulgarian flag. So here upon execution of the bare boat charter, the Bulgarian registration is temporarily suspended and the Croatian, um, uh, this thing, the Croatian flag uh, registration comes into being. So the, uh, the Bulgaria is the flagging out state and you have Croatia which is the flagging in state. Now in bare boat charter, the owner of the ship leases out to uh, the ship to the charter for a fixed period of time. And once the charterer takes possession of the ship, the charterer becomes ex uh, entirely responsible for the ship, including everything like, you know, the vessel, the crew, um, the maintenance, the repairs, the insurance of the ship, everything. In exchange of the use of the vessel, the charterer will pay to the ship owner um, a daily, monthly or a weekly amount which is known as a hire. Okay. Now this is um, uh, now this is very much similar to that of like I had mentioned previously also like the renting of a um, renting of an office space say for example if I have rented out uh, if I have taken on rent any office space then I am um, allowed to you know put my name nameplate on the board so um, I would mention over there uh, you know, advocate of Akarnalkar, and um, I would also say this is my my office. Although it's not, I'm not the owner. I've just rented out. I've just taken it on rent, but I would say that this is my office. I would also put my name plate, and um, uh, you know, I would be responsible for whatever the electricity, the maintenance, the normal usual wear and tear. So the bare boat chart is, is similar to something like renting out an office space. All right. So a quick recap of the bare boat charter. This is also known as demise charter. The owner of the ship leases the ship or a part of the ship to the charterer for a fixed period and the complete responsibility of the ship and its operation is now on the charterer. 
the charterer will pay uh, an amount known as the charter hire charges to the owner and the charterer becomes a de facto owner of the ship okay one distinguishing factor of uh, the bare boat char charter is that um, um, is the is the fact of control of uh, of how much control he has over the ship so if the owner of the ship uh, retains the control of the ship then we cannot say it's a bare boat charter we will not say it's a bare boat or a demise charter but if the charterer controls the ship just like he is the owner then in that case we will say it is a bare boat charter so so this is one distinguishing factor of bare boat charters next you have the voyage charter and this is the most common form of charter party agreement or uh, you let's say the ship is chartered for a one way voyage between point a to point b and there is a negotiated rate of freight for that so then this will be called a voyage charter like i had said um from uh, southampton to um, antwerp port okay so this will be a voyage charter but if i say that the the ship is uh, on charter for 12 months then this will be a time charter okay so the ship is chartered for a one way voyage between specific ports with a specific cargo at a negotiated rate of freight and the rate is always calculated based on tonnage actually even the weights of ships are calculated on the basis of tonnage okay so this amount will have to be paid um, so there is a or sometimes there is a lump sum okay so either it can be the the, the freight can be fixed on the basis of how much cargo you are carrying or it can be a fixed rate then no matter how much you want to carry you want to carry the same amount or you want to carry less okay the ship owner bears all the costs related to the expenses um of the voyage including the crew maintenance the bunkers etc okay so the voyage charter in voyage charter the ship is chartered for a particular voyage or a particular journey a trip now if there is a delay in the voyage like for example the voyage is longer than it was expected it was supposed to be for one week and it is now for one week plus 3 days more then um the ship owner bears the risk okay so the ship owner cannot ask for uh, extra freight charges from the charterer to compensate for the delay because the agreement is for the entire voyage now um, similarly on the other hand also if you see if the voyage takes a shorter time for example it was expected that it is going to be for one week but it takes only 5 days then the ship owner is benefited you know because anyways he doesn't get affected because he gets the full freight so no matter if you complete the voyage in 5 days or you complete it in one week plus more time then still you get the uh, the full freight okay however in many cases there are case laws on this also uh, where uh, there should not be you know there should be reasonable dispatch this is also one theory in law that if you are taking a voyage charter then you cannot make unexpected delays okay there should you should uh, there should be reasonable dispatch of the voyage i mean you cannot simply delay uh, the voyage all right for a, except if for if there are any valid reasons for that all right uh, so this was about voyage charter now let's go to time charter okay so in time charter the ship is chartered by the charterer for a specified time to for a specified or for a specified tonnage the manning and navigation of the ship remains uh, in the control of the ship owner and similar to the other charter party agreements the charterer pays pays higher charges to the ship owner now seeing all these three charters we can understand that the distinguishing factor of bare boat charter is from the other two from voyage and time is the uh, the amount of control okay so in bare boat charter this charterer gets control over everything okay so he is like the de facto owner of the uh, of the ship all right so okay so now let's let's move on this is okay so this is a good chart where you see in uh, bare boat charter the charterer has control over almost everything in voyage and time it's kind of mixed okay all right so every chart okay so i have to say this every charter party today is based on certain forms which are universally accepted okay so if they uh, if the parties wish they can definitely make changes but um, the main format okay uh, remains standardized throughout throughout international trade over the globe so if the parties wish they can make changes to it but 
starting the starting point is these standard charter party agreements okay and where can you find these standard charter party agreements so there are uh, like i had explained in my first lecture my very first lecture that there are international maritime organizations and one of them is the bimco and just like bimco we have intertanko and helempa these are all examples of associations that have framed standard charter party agreements and the most commonly used voyage charter party agreements are there with the bimco what you can see on the screen so the bimco gencon charter party agreement bal time and the nype charter party agreement these are very popular used for dry cargo and for time charter parties so depending on what is your type of charter party and what um what goods you are exporting um there are specialized uh, or you know charter party agreements for that like for oil also you have a different for dry cargo you have different for um for grains you have a different charter party all right so this what you can see on the screen is of bimco so bimco is an international shipping association which represents ship owners and its membership represents approximately 60% of the world's merchant shipping tonnage so this bimco has formulated standard formats for charter party agreements and depending on what trans what cargo you are exporting or importing and um what is your arrangement you can have that specific type of charter party agreements so you can see over here um on the bimco website so you can see on the bimco website over here bimco.org if you go over here you can see a list of all the bimco con contracts okay the bal time like i have mentioned bear con these are very popular ones and if you want a specific clause you want to you know uh, you know want to get a different clause then you can also go to bimco clauses and they have specific clauses also if you want to insert in those charter party agreements if you want to make any changes so this is uh, regarding the standard charter party agreements and like i had mentioned gencon 94 this is popular for bulk cargo and this one is popular for carrying chemicals in bulk okay now the last part of this module is on certain important clauses in a charter party agreement so like i mentioned there are uh, standard forms of charter party but at times uh, not at times i mean whenever the parties want they can also amend uh, a few clauses of the charter party agreements so there are different charter party formats for different trading routes and the cargo that they, that is carried nevertheless the basic outline of this charter party remains the same and that's why we have achieved um i would say some form of uh, uniformity in international trade in shipping now let's look at these uh, special terms first is lay time now let's take a example where goods are being uh, you know shipped from southampton to antwerp now the ship is chartered by the charterer on a voyage charter and he pays voyage freight charge to the ship owner now the charterer will need some time or some not time for a few hours or maybe a few days to load the goods onto the ship in southampton the ships are huge they would want to uh, the charterer might want to load on uh, the goods onto the ship and he might need a good amount of time for that now similarly um, even uh, the charterer will also need some time to unload the cargo okay so the loading and unloading takes hours sometimes even days it might even take up to a week so now this time is known as the the loading and the unloading time this is known as lay days okay l a y lay days now during the lay day the ship will be standing alongside the shore for loading or unloading it will be just be standing idle because the loading unloading loading or the unloading process might take uh, that time the loading and unloading might be taking place the freight charge that the charterer pays the ship owner is known includes the lay day okay so if so whatever amount that the charterer is paying the ship owner that also includes the time which is taken by the charterer to load the vessel uh, to to load the goods onto the ship and also to unload all right so in a voyage charter party agreement the charterer is not just paying for the voyage start to end but is also paying what happens before the voyage starts that is the loading process and after the voyage ends 
the unloading process so it's also paying for that time okay now the charterer will want adequate number of days for lay time so that you know if there might be any days any uh, any delay any unanticipated delay or any emergency might take might happen so in that case the lay time might increase okay the lay days might increase now this this uh, lay time that's why it must be mentioned in the charter party agreement it's also important to mention in the contract the exact time when the lay time starts because i have seen numerous cases even if you do a bit of research on this there are numerous cases where the dispute is on the time when the lay time starts okay so normally this lay time starts at the moment the ship has arrived at the port now when i am saying the moment the ship has arrived at the port there are numerous disputes worldwide which have been taken place on what is an arrived ship now the ship has come but there is something else going on and that's why the parties are fighting on this that no the ship has actually not arrived okay so what is an arrived ship is also something which is very disputed in contracts and that is why it is essential that parties mention each and everything in the contract so that later disputes do not arise all right so normally this the time when the lay, when the lay time starts is the moment when the ship has arrived at the port and parties please mention what do you mean by an arrived ship okay so an arrived ship is basically in in simple terms when the ship is ready to load okay but sometimes there can be a waiting time at the berth okay so all of these exigencies might have to be taken care of like the it might happen that the ship has actually arrived at the port but it is not suitable for loading for some or the other reason like some repairs need to be done it had the ship needs to be sanitized something like that so in that case we would not say it's an arrived ship although it has arrived but it is not ready to load so you cannot start the lay time at that moment all right so while drafting or negotiating or charter party agreement make sure that you take care of all these exigencies the lay time is mentioned in hours or days okay and the loading rate is also mentioned at times like 100 tons of cargo in 5 hours or 100 tons of cargo per day okay if the charterer is unable to load the cargo within the stipulated lay time then he has to pay an extra charge which is known as demurrage okay this is demurrage or dispatch money so if the charterer is not able to load the cargo within the stipulated lay time then he has to pay extra charge for exceeding the lay time and this is known as demurrage and what happens if he takes less time then this is beneficial to the ship owner because the ship can now set sail set sail um, at an earlier time so just like how there is a penalty for exceeding the lay time which is known as demurrage there is also an incentive for completing the loading in less time okay and this is known as dispatch money okay so demurrage and dispatch money both are different um, dispatch demurrage is a penalty for exceeding your lay time the when the charterer wants to avail an extra time for loading the goods and if he loads it in less time then this is known as the dispatch money okay this is like an incentive that he gets the dispatch money now moving ahead um okay so one more point is that the lay time starts at the loading point when the ship is ready to load and the loading point for the ship can be the berth it can be the dock or it can be the port itself so all of these points have to be mentioned in the charter party agreement okay the next question is uh, who loads or uh, unloads the cargo so whose responsibility it is so the default legal position in common law is that it is the responsibility of the charterer to bring the cargo alongside the ship or alongside the vessel to reach the and reach the ship's tackle along which then it is the duty of the ship owner to load it and the vice versa in case of unloading but uh, i mean this totally depends on what the parties have agreed to each other so you can you have to stipulate your very intrinsic details um in the contract okay but if your contract is silent then obviously this is the default uh, position okay okay so there are two more points which we have to see what is debt freight and what is hire and off hire okay now the cargo clause in the charter party often is um, 
is given in detail of of always gives the detail of how much ton of cargo is to be carried what type of cargo is to be carried and it also gives a brief description of how the cargo is packed like you know 20 cartons of um uh, of tuna fish packed in one foil case etc whatever so a brief description of um, the packaging is also mentioned like or it can be mentioned like 100 cargo cardboard boxes with insulation etc so the charterer has to load the amount of cargo that he has agreed in the contract if he loads less then this will be a loss to the ship owner because the ship owner earns freight charges from every unit of cargo so if i say 1000 units or 1000 tons of cargo was agreed but the charterer provides only 900 then what about the freight charges for those 100 tons that the ship owner had reserved so because the ship owner has reserved 1000 tons but only 900 was loaded so what do you do in this case the charterer still has to pay for those remaining 100 and this is known as dead freight basically you are paying freight but you are not loading the cargo so if i have agreed to 1000 tons i have to put 1000 if not 1000 i have to pay for those 1000 even if i load less amount okay so this is known as dead freight normally english courts allow for a 3 to 5% increase or decrease in cargo so it might happen that in, in instead of 1000 i have put a you know four five tons extra so a little bit 3 to 5% is acceptable in uh, by english courts but it also depends a lot on uh, what is the trade norm in your country okay the next is hire and off hire now this is particular to time charter party agreements hire is the price paid by the charterer for using the vessel okay it's basically like you have taken something on rent the rent that you are paying is for the time is for that time that you have agreed to use that space so hire is basically the price paid by the charterer for using the vessel it is usually calculated on the basis of a fixed sum per ton of the vessel dead freight for a specified period of time and off hire is the time is a period of time the ship is not optimally or fully available to the charterer because of any defect or accident that has take place okay for which the ship owner is responsible so if there is for example some uh, uh, some kind of repair that has to be done uh, to the ship and this is response the responsibility of the ship owner okay so then the basically the charterer has to wait for the ship to be in good condition for him to use the ship so that is known as off hire basically he is hired the ship but it's of no use to him till the repairs are not done so this is known as off hire so this brings us to the end of charter party agreements and we will also look into bill of ladings now